testing one two three testing testing Did it not do it again? One. It's this one you got to worry about. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I, I, I think it's working now. Okay. I, I do want to express my heartfelt appreciation to the Greater Orlando Baptist Association, to Tom and his team for their preparation, and to this church for hosting the meeting. So let's give uh, Tom just a token of our appreciation. Thank you very much, Dr. Cheney. Mark, thank you very much for manning the cameras. He's done a great job, and we appreciate your being a part of today. And First time out. Really. All right. Well, thank you very much. It has been, it's really been my privilege to, uh, to be a part of this conference. Uh, let me just ask you, you know, who, who are these guys? Can any of you uh, think of maybe like some names that might be associated with these descriptors? Peter, Paul, Luke. These were all actually people who were marketplace individuals who had been called to church planting. And, you know, we know that uh, Paul was a tent maker and church planter. We don't know for sure about Peter or about Luke, whether they were bivocational. But let me just assure you that Scripture does not indicate that they were full-time and endorsed by the trustees of the denomination. We don't see that in Scripture. But you know what we do know is we could add others, we could add clothiers, dealers in purple, jailers, politicians, uh, and other tent makers who were church planters and they were bivocational. One of the things that uh, has always been somewhat foreign to me because of my background is the idea that the goal of ministry is to be called into full-time vocational work mainly because I was called to ministry in northern California, I mean northern Minnesota. Nobody up there was a full-time pastor. Our association, which at that time was called the Northwoods Baptist Association, consisted of 13 churches and missions, and only one had a full-time pastor, and even he was bivocational. Now, he was unique. He said, I'm not bivocational. I'm full-time in ministry, because he was also a National Guard chaplain. And he just hated being called bivocational. And I'm, I'm thinking, I think that's cool. Uh, my background is in nursing. I'm a registered nurse. Later on, I went into hospital administration. I still maintain those credentials because I really don't know the whims of the future, the whims of the denomination. Uh, and I want to keep the doors open of wherever God might call me. But what I can say, in my roles, I have been able to go into communities that even to this day, do not have full-time pastors, and even, even with all of the strategies that we would be putting together in the metro areas, they're, they're not cities that the denomination or state convention could probably justify going to plant churches. When I went to Halleck, Minnesota, which was one of the greatest training grounds for me in all of my experience, um, you know, we're talking a town of 1,200 that was in decline, Today, it's under 1,000. When I went there, the graduating class, the previous five years of the high school, not one graduate stayed in town. The town had 1,400 Lutherans, meaning that they had more Lutherans than they had residents. And they really didn't need a Baptist church because three others had been attempted to plant and three have failed. Nobody really saw that other than God just continued to place it on an individual's heart and the association said, we can't give this city up. We know that God wants to do something in Halleck, Minnesota. I responded to that call because I was bivocational. I was able to get a job in the local hospital slash nursing home. I was able to be and engage myself in the community. The bivocational alternative allows the church to put its resources into ministry rather than into salaries. You know, it's not unusual for a church to put 30 to 40% of their income into salaries. The bivocational planter can allow the church to focus the resources in the areas of outreach. Uh, bivocationalism, again, gives us some exciting names, uh, such as Paul, the apostle, as examples of a strategy that we just seem to overlook. And I'm just going to be really speaking to this perspective of the existing churches here. 
Because sometimes we, whether consciously or subconsciously, make bivocationalism sound like second-rate ministry. One of the churches I'm proudest to say that God gave me the privilege of serving is Friendship Baptist Church in Holden, Missouri. I've used them as an illustration several times. By being a bivocational planter, God was able to use me to plant a church that nobody else wanted to go to. Nobody else was interested in attempting it. In fact, I'm thinking of some of you. Some of you are saying, well, hold it now. Look, don't, don't look at me. I'm full-time in denominational work. I'm so full-time with the state or full-time with the association. I'm full-time with my church. The irony is I am a full-time professor. In fact, Tom, I bet you would, you would agree. I probably work, what, 30, 40 hours a week sometimes. Yeah. At Midwestern, I serve as the vice president for accreditation. So I handle all of our accreditation issues, institutional effectiveness. I am the dean of the online and distance education programs, and I'm the director of doctoral studies. Our school has about 1,300 students. Of those 1,300 students, 700 of them fall under the programs I'm in charge of. My days start very early, and they end usually about 6 o'clock in the evening when I get home, and I'm one that I go to bed early. Guys, I understand where you're at. I understand what it means to have way more on your plate than you feel like you have time to do. And yet I realize that one day a week I was going to give to God, and one day a week is all it takes to plant a church if you're bivocational. Because you don't have to worry about the fundraising now. You don't have to worry. So some of you, this, this, this challenge is not, on the, uh, this is not on the PowerPoint. My challenge to some of you is can you be bivocational? Is there someone in your church that you could encourage it may be that what you need to do is say, hey, would you talk, call this guy in Kansas City, Rodney Harrison, about what it means to be bivocational? Because we have people who I really believe if you give them a God-sized task, they might just say, I'm interested in doing that. I would have never thought a church could be started one day a week, but it can be. And uh, we'll talk about some of the reasons that's, that's possible. Now, if you're a pastor, obviously, I don't want you to uh, sacrifice your ministry, although I will say this, I know several pastors who have planted multiple churches, including myself. I think both Tom and I have been involved in uh, being a pastor and a planter at the same time. Both of us have done that, where we're doing two at once. So sometimes, if you can't find the church planter, you need to ask the question, is God maybe saying, do both? Eh, just a thought. Well, let me ask you this, can a bivocational really build a church? The church growth principles taught by Charles Brock, one of my heroes in ministry, is that in many situations, it is the prolonged exposure to the Word of God that is the best way to assure people make genuine decisions for Christ. I want you to hear what Brock said again. He said the number one thing that really is, is critical is that they have the prolonged exposure to the Word of God. And if you are on a time frame of 24 months of funding or three years of funding, you oftentimes will not have that prolonged exposure, especially in people groups that are highly resistant to the gospel. In fact, oftentimes what we do is we remove them, those areas of resistance, from our strategic plan because we want to focus on areas that are highly receptive, which I agree is a wise strategy, but there are exceptions to that. And those exceptions are when God leads us to the difficult areas and when we have strategies that aren't requiring long-term funding. I don't think it's fair to go to your church and say, give me five years or ten years of funding. But if you have a bivocational strategy, you don't necessarily need that funding. Prolonged exposure to the Word of God. Bivocationalism allows the minister to have that prolonged relationship with a people group and in the workplace, and we aren't having to be spending a lot of money while we're doing it. So let me ask you this. Can they build a church? Absolutely, because bivocationalism usually provides not only a prolonged presence in the community or the cultural group, but in the workplace where the bivocational is serving. He has that as a, an advantage. The church planter's vocation will often place him in contact with the unchurched on a daily basis. When I went to Halleck, Minnesota, 
being a registered nurse, you're, you're going to be shocked with this, but my core group were people related to what? The hospital. The director of nursing joined our church. It just happened to be her husband was the county extension director. One of the CNAs, that'd be a, a, a certified uh, aide, one of the aides, she joined the church. Her husband was a truck driver. One of the ladies who had MS and was a patient at the hospital had been ministered through and by me. Her family joined the church, and that became the beginning of our children's ministry because they had five kids, she had MS, and nobody, everybody was scared of her. And the Lutheran church, she said, wow, the people from the Baptist church have been in my room and visited me, and I've not seen anyone from my church. But I did get a letter saying that I was behind in my annual fund contribution. So uh, needless to say, you know, that, that was a providential opportunity. What I found is that oftentimes in bivocationalism, uh, these bivocationals, they just automatically recognize their vocation is an extension of the highest vocation, which is to be obedient to the call of God. I'll tell you what, it is not sub-quality to be in a vocation if that's where God has called you. Point of personal privilege. So that means I'm going to get in trouble because this is being taped. I go to conferences, and I go to chapel every week at Midwestern, and I've been to chapel in many seminaries. And oftentimes we'll have somebody that gets into these conferences, and then they're kind of seeing the students fall asleep a little bit, you know how students are, and they'll say something like this, Men, I want you to listen. The highest calling of God is to be called as a pastor of a Baptist church. And suddenly everybody's, amen, amen. What, what are we doing? Amening heresy? Where in Scripture does it say the highest calling of God is limited to 48% of the population by gender, 2% of the population by denomination? And of that 2%, 1% by calling. Heresy from the pits of hell. And we're amening it on a regular basis, guys. And so when we talk to our members about the value of bivocationalism, about the possibility of being bivocational, they're going, well, that's nice, but I know that truly the highest calling of God is to be called as a pastor of a Baptist church because we amen it. Can I just say our members believe what we affirm? And, and they're going to go to the word, but man, where are they going to hear the word first from? Us. The power of the preaching of the word. And we need to make sure we're not telling them heretical, popular tweets. That's like a tweet that doesn't have any substantiation from the source of God's word. God's word says that the highest calling is to be obedient to whatever calling there is. And I really believe many more in our churches are being called out. Amen. We need to recognize them, send them, and affirm them, and let them know that it might be that this sponsoring church that you've been just kind of gnawing with is already, the leadership's already in your congregation. And so the bivocational, they, they will have contact with people that we will never see. I had contact with people in hospitals, Harris Methodist Fort Worth, Kitson Memorial. I had contact with people I could never have reached if I would have been full-time in ministry. Bivocationalism often allows the planter to live at a higher standard of living. C can I just simply say that one of the, the challenges I see is oftentimes people are turned off by pastors because they see them as always, they're not paying their bills. They're, they're behind in their payments. They're, you know, their, their car is always broken down because they can't afford to get it fixed. And they're going, whoa, and, and you're saying that God is really good? Well, what you're saying is correct, but boy, you sure don't model it. And I see that happening. And sometimes we, we see our church planners struggling and it may be that that struggle is part of God's plan. 
I won't go through the, the story of our journey. God brought my wife and I to a point, though, where we, we had nothing. I've been there. I, I have been in the depths of nothingness and poverty. But what I found as a bivocational is oftentimes I was doing pretty good. Um, hospital administrators make money. They actually pay you and you get a check and it's, it's nice. And it was really nice because people then, not only was I not taking money from the church, but it was really cool to sometimes be the biggest contributor. I mean, I never saw the giving records, but I have a feeling that oftentimes my tithes and offerings probably led the pack. Now, does that sound like biblical that we ought to be leaders in giving? Should we be leaders in the example? Now, I hope that we're leaders proportionately. I believe we should be. And the irony is I never thought I had the gift of giving. In fact, I used to joke about that's the, God didn't give me the gift of giving, you know. The reality is I, I've come to realize in the last few years, I think maybe God has, and it's scary because it means it's all his. I don't have anything. I was so deceived when I used to think I had something. It's not mine. And uh, I'll tell you what, though, it is awesome to see planters. Um, Tom knows the story. I'm not going to go into it, but needless to say, when I became a planter in the Dakotas, I, I definitely made waves when I showed up to my first associational meeting in a Porsche. Um, and yet that, was, that car was very winsome in the community. I mean, every teenager wanted to be like the preacher at the Baptist church. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, I was like a rock star there because it was so cool in a farming community. They didn't even know two things. They didn't know what they looked like, and they couldn't pronounce it. No, it's not porch. Porsche. Two syllables. Um, so it was really cool. It was really cool because, you know, they, they just like, wow, you know, those other church, the other Baptists that were here, like they were always poor and begging for money and had to have teams come up from like Florida to fix things for them. And like, you're like real. You, you, oh, you're average. You, you actually have a car that gets places. Um, you know, sometimes that's important. And bivocationalism may allow a church planner to live at a much higher standard of living than they would otherwise. And again, that's not the template, but I'm, that's an advantage. Bivocationalism oftentimes will provide legitimacy, especially in some settings. Let me go back to northern Minnesota. Uh, we'd had three failed church plants in Baptist plants in Halleck, this little bitty town. I, I, the reason that they kept trying is it was the county seat. And do you remember back in Bold Mission Thrust when the goal of Bold Mission Thrust was to have a church in every county? Anybody remember that? every county seat would have a church. That was the goal of Bold Mission Thrust. And so from 1975 until 1982, they'd had three attempts to start a Southern Baptist church in Halleck because that was the goal of our denominational focus. All failed. And um, the last failure, Baptist got a bad name. And so, you know, I came there. And if I would have come in there as a Baptist church planter, I can assure you, nobody would have really cared that I was there, nor would they have been interested. However, when I came to help save their hospital from closure, everybody liked me. I was there to save jobs. I was there to help the community. And when we started the church, suddenly there was great legitimacy in what we were doing, and they were very interested in to know what I believe and why I believe it. Bivocationalism will often bring legitimacy in a community. And if you have men and women in your church that um, have skills that are needed, this oftentimes becomes the platform that God will use. And that's why I think when we go back and see in Scripture, God used people that were, had influence in the political community, influence in the market, in marketplace community. God does that at times because it provides legitimacy for the message. I, I'll tell you, in northern Minnesota, being, oh, well, I'm getting money from churches in Texas and Florida to come up here and start a church, that does not give you legitimacy in Minnesota. In fact, people will look at that and they'll call that, oh, they're just like the Mormons trying to proselyte. So again, legitimacy is sometimes a very valid reason. Here's one approach that has been used over the years, and that would be maybe multiple bivocational staff instead of one full-time staff. If you have thought about a launch large or you are looking at planning a, a church in a uh, newer community or a place where you really do need a church that will grow rapidly, we oftentimes think, well, can we get the funds to support a full-time pastor? What about getting an uh, approach where you have multiple bivocationals instead? 
Again, allowing the resources to be used differently. If you have four bivocationals, don't forget those four are going to be tithing and those four tithes are going to, again, help offset what you're doing. You multiply the size of that core group and you might even look at a strategy such as do you have someone who's going to be more the missionary, the teacher, the preacher, the evangelist. You know, some have used this Ephesians 4 model. A church in Oklahoma used this and uh, they are running over a thousand with, and they've never had a full time staff. the regular microphone okay we're doing this to tape I, I, you all could hear me i'm sure otherwise but we're doing this taping this you so okay well I, I thank you by the way for not walking out on me when i said that <laughs> guys you understand i love preaching and i'm called to be one who preaches but we have to be careful with what we say we send the wrong message to our congregation sometimes and it subconsciously says, I can't be like you. We don't know what God's call is. Maybe he wants them to be like you. And want, they want you to mentor them. And we don't want to put barriers. Again, this approach here that I'm talking about now, though, is this uh, uh, approach that allows multiple bivocationals to be a part of a church plant. This is an approach that we've now used successfully in Missouri a few times. And, you know, I, I wish I would have utilized it more over the years. Again, there are times that you, you look back and you know, what do they say about hindsight being 2020? We clearly have some plants that would have benefited from this approach with either a fully bivocational planning team or a blended bivocational planning team. And so, again, be uh, thinking about that approach. Here are seven bivocational advantages that have been identified. Number one, more laity of necessity become involved in the ministry of the church. Let me give an example once again of my most recent church plant uh, there at Friendship Baptist. There at that church, we have to this day all bivocational staff. We have four bivocational staff members. We added the fourth one when the church was running about 60. Today, the church runs about three times that. They've started several churches, but they still are using this bivocational approach. The strength of it was in those early days when I was working one day a week as a bivocational pastor, the laity had to do the work. They really had to keep things going. They were very involved. They did the uh, work of the ministry. And here's something that is critical to understand. We are to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, and yet what we tend to do is equip the saints to do the work of the ministry we don't want to do. So most of our churches do a lot of evangelism training and door-knocking training, win, faith, others. Why? That way we don't have to do it. But we, well, it's, it's going to get even ouchier here in a minute. Do we teach them to do the work of the ministry? Who does the baptisms in your church? Are you equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry, or are you doing it? You know, there's a reason that Paul starts off one of his letters by saying, you know, I thank God I've not baptized any of you. And then he kind of goes back and, well, okay, there was a few. The last baptism I did, I think, was about 12 years ago. Because God moved heavily on my heart that equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry, give them the fun stuff to do. If someone baptizes someone, they'll never forget it. And they have an accountability. They now have a relationship. And I have a relationship with the person I equip to do that. 
Yeah. Now, needless to say, I will lose my Landmark Baptist of the Month award by saying that. But uh, the reality is, the reality is we are to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And when we take seriously that command, um, Tom, are you okay to have the podcast have controversial subject matter? Okay. Why, why are we limiting baptism to 48% of the population? Now, let me just say, I'm not talking about something that's improper. I'm talking about being circumspect. Have you ever been in a baptistry with a woman that when they get wet, suddenly, uh-oh? I mean, I've had times where the clothing they're wearing suddenly looks a little bit sheer. I've had times when things haven't worked right. I've had issues. You know what? Wouldn't it be just nicer if women baptized women and men baptized men and you didn't have to mess with any of the improprieties? And, you know, is, Scripture doesn't say they can't. And can I just simply say, we have one thing to go by, and that is Scripture. Scripture is very clear on many issues. When, and, and so I, I am proud to be Southern Baptist because I believe that, you know, the fact that we hold high God's word, that's critical. Man, if we, let that, if we start a slippery slope, we don't realize how fast we'll gain momentum. Well, we kind of do because that's why we had to fight it in the last three decades. But, folks, we also sometimes over-interpret scripture. And when Paul said to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, what about the Great Commission? Who was the Great Commission given to? Was it given to the church? What's the Great Commission command us to do? Okay, and, and then how do we, how's that, yeah, we make disciples and then we do that by baptizing them who? Obviously just the pastors. That was just, just the pastors, right? Because the Great Commission was just given to the 12, well, 11 at that point. No, I, I can't find a commentary that agrees with the fact it was given to the 11 because it doesn't fit the construct of the verbs and it doesn't fit the construct of the, the text in the Greek. It doesn't fit the context of the other Great Commission passages. And so we say it's, this is given to the church and yet we say this is given to the church but this is only the pastor's role. Equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry. In the bivocational church, that became a reality because I, all I had time to do is train some of the people that were really growing and those that I'd led to the Lord, I would train them to do the work of the ministry, and then they trained others. And by the way, you have to trust the Holy Spirit because it's going to be radical when they get a hold of the Word of God and start reading it because they're going to start asking you questions. Pastor, remember, this was a restart church. That old church that used to be here, they did some funny things. Why did they do that? Because they start looking at all the crazy things that they used to do, and they're going, why did they do that? Because they impair growth. Now, here's my disclaimer, and it's more than a disclaimer. Never do something that would split the church. Never do anything that would be a stumbling block. Paul said, even though you have rights, that doesn't give you liberty at all times. So we have to be careful. Know your congregation. Never do anything. Don't teach them. Recognize that many of your members are on milk. Don't try to get them to accept something that would violate their conscience. But... There are other things we can do. We don't have to have the women baptizing women. No, you don't have to do that, but you do need to be thinking about what does it mean to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry? Because if you're a bivocational, you don't have time. And if you're sponsoring a bivocational, you can't expect them to be at your planning meetings on Tuesday night, your Wednesday night service, and all this other stuff. You're going to have to really look and say, what do we expect of our, 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 our pastor that we're sponsoring or the church we're supporting if he's bivocational. But the neat part is, in that church, the laity will pick up the slack. The bivocational pastor is not expected to be Superman. The bivocational pastor is usually more in touch with the real world because he understands Obamacare from a personal perspective. He understands things such as changes in the workplace. He understands what it means to have 7% of your salary taken out for Social Security. And he and of course, we get to pay double that. Isn't that nice? Uh, he understands what's going on in the world oftentimes. He understands the little petty arguments that might cause people to uh, have concerns. The bivocational pastor has more opportunities for personal witnessing because they're in the workplace. And because of time constraints, they're less likely to succumb to the temptation of becoming lazy. 
And I hate to say it, but some full-time pastors, they're trying to figure out how to fill that 40-hour week, and they, they spend it with unproductive things. The bivocational pastor does not have time to become involved in convention controversy. That's not a bad thing. I don't know many bivocational pastors that do a lot of blogging. They don't spend full time 20 hours a week on their Facebook page. They don't have time to. The bivocational pastor is more apt to allow, the bivocational church is more apt to allow their pastor to be very real. They don't put him on a pedestal. They don't. It's amazing. In the bivocational church, they tend to just say, yeah, this is our pastor. Uh, he, this is how he is. This, and, and they let you be much more real. Uh, it is exciting because I've been a part of that. So as a word to the sponsoring church, please be careful how you communicate your values. When, when I first felt called to be in ministry, my pastor talked about uh, not going certain places, not going to certain schools. And yet one thing he said is, Rod, you need to get to seminary. That was a value. You need to get to seminary. And I appreciate that. He, he set a standard for me even though he knew that right now in northern Minnesota was such a great need for church planters that I, I could have easily had a church without it. It was only later on that I realized that my mentor and pastor didn't have seminary. So he wasn't trying to teach me to be like him. He was trying to teach me and equip me. He, he set the right message with his values. What about us? Do we set the right message do we, do we speak of full-time ministry as being superior to bivocational ministry? Do we speak of, I was called to full-time ministry? Because here's the reality of that. You may be called to full-time ministry, but are you so committed to the church that God's called you that if the funding goes down or a special project comes that needs extraordinary amounts of money, would you be willing to be bivocational for your church? I've been there. Are you willing to become bivocational for your church so that it can fulfill the mission that God has placed on it? Sometimes that becomes the test. Are you a shepherd or a hireling? And if we start speaking of full-time ministry as the goal, we inadvertently shut the door for those who might be exploring that call. I want to say I counted a privilege to be a full-time minister. And I also counted a privilege to be a bivocational pastor and church planter. Now, right now, I don't know if there's such a thing, but I'm a bivocational Sunday school teacher. I've been in, this is the most unique journey in my life. For the first time in 30-plus years of ministry, I'm now a Sunday school teacher. Wow, that's a different ministry. But on the other hand, the Sunday school is larger than most churches. So uh, it's, it's been fun. I mean, a lot, most church plans. The point is, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a fun journey. And God has taught me that I have the same joy and work in ministry, being a Sunday school teacher, as I did when I was a pastor of a near major. And now that I moved away from the microphone and this particular, okay, yeah, sorry about that, Tom. Okay, well, do we have any questions about bivocationalism? Yes, um, the gentleman that came in from the IMB really is reflecting upon a worldwide trend. Bivocationalism will probably be uh, growing not only in the Southern Baptist Convention, but I think we're even going to be seeing denominations such as uh, the Roman Catholic Church that is now looking at bivocational priests. We are seeing the uh, ELCA, which would be probably the most mainline of the uh, Protestant churches in America, 
Uh, they're looking at bivocationalism with their ordained clergy. One of the responses, for example, let me just give a, an example of my seminary, Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Uh, we are owned and operated by the Southern Baptist Convention, meaning that everything we do must align with what the convention has chartered us to do. Our mission is to serve the church by biblically educating God-called men and women to be and make disciples of Christ. That is the template by which we, we have to assess everything. That would be our vision statement, you might say, if you were a local church. We have just been approved as of yesterday by our creditors to begin dual majors. We will be having majors in business, humanities, communications, uh, music, later on, education, credentialing programs in education, along with biblical studies and Christian ministry. Why? We have made the decision that we must equip those who can be marketplace ministers. The nomination will never have the funding that it needs to fund every church plant. We have seen from the churches and their giving that they are reticent to be supporting of everything that is needed in a full-time strategy. The bivocational option means that people will be more readily able to start churches as they go, as God moves them to places. You know, just think of your church. Where have people from your church moved? I think of my church. Uh, we have people that now live in North Pole, Alaska. We have people from my class who now live in Maryland. We have people in my class who now are in California. Um, we have one that's moving to Tucson, and they're going to be a part of a church planning team as they go by vocationally. And so with this natural movement of people, our denomination is beginning to develop strategies so that those who are called to ministry will also have marketable degrees. Well, that's not a radical new development. This is simply saying, Lord, you did the same thing with the Apostle Paul. You equipped him with a skill that was able to be used by you. And we want to ensure our young people have those skills. We also have a large number of young people that come to seminary exploring the call. They're just not really sure exactly. Can I just be frank? We have a radical change in the seminaries, and this is not just Midwestern. This is every seminary. The MDiv programs are collapsing everywhere because the young people coming to our schools, they're going, yeah, God's called me to the ministry, but I sure don't want to be a pastor. Why? What is it scaring? What's scaring them about being a pastor? What they have seen. What they have seen their pastor go through. Yeah. I mean, understand, they have been seeing their pastors sued. They see their pastors, they, they've been in business meetings, and it just scares them to death what they see, how people treat their pastors. So they're coming to school saying, I, I've been called, but, but anything but a pastor. Now, praise God, many of them, as they are there, they suddenly realize, okay, wow, this is kind of a fear issue. But many more young people are coming to school today exploring the call. And the bivocational gives them a sense of confidence. Um, I'm in a pro this isn't, I hope, out of school, but uh, this may be something that you would edit. I don't know, but okay, no edit. What I'm going to say is very simply this. Uh, I've survived some, some interesting changes at our schools. We went through some leadership changes, and one of the reasons I had the confidence to speak the truth in love is because I knew that if they said, well, Rod, your services are not needed at Midwestern, uh, do you think I could get a job as a registered nurse or a hospital administration? Do you think I could get a job fairly quickly? Yeah, do you think that I could continue to make sure there are mortgages paid and my family's taken care of? Okay, do you think that gave me a boldness to speak the truth in love? Yes. How many pastors are cowering from the pulpits or from antagonists because they're afraid that they will get fired? And let me say, that's a, that, that could be a reality. That's why Paul talks about evil people in the church. There are people out there who are in the church, and, and we tend to be quiet because we have to sometimes fear for our job. And you know what? We're in a conflict there because we know the Scripture says that, you know, he who doesn't provide for his family is worse than an infidel. So we understand we have that responsibility. We don't want to become a burden on a society. But on the other hand, we also want to, uh, 
to speak the truth. And so having a, uh, you might say having a backup plan gives us some boldness that we know we can do the right thing. Bivocationalism. Even if it is just a matter of making sure that our young people who are called to ministry have those skill sets, they could be a Paul if needed be. They, they, that if, for example, the check from Macedonia or Corinth doesn't materialize, they are not going to have to forfeit the call of God that is on their life. But they have an alternative. That's why we call this chapter the bivocational alternative. May the Lord bless you your ministries. May anything that I said that he wants erased be erased, but folks, may you understand my great love for you and what you're doing, the commitment that you are making just to be here, saying we believe in the missional process of sponsoring churches, that we believe in this. And I would like to close my section by praying for you, and then I know that Dr. Cheney will be taking over and saying some words. Father, for these men that are here my prayer is your favor would be granted to them as they communicate the truths of your word that they've heard from the pastor of this church, from Dr. Cheney, and from the presentations that you have given me the privilege of sharing today. May your blessing be upon them as they sort through and as they sift through that which has been heard, that, Lord, they might be like the Brians who sought out the scripture and checked to make sure it was so, and that, Lord, they would have a confidence and a boldness to be able to say to their churches, this is what the Great Commission demands, and we will be favorable to you, and we want to be obedient to you. For failure through complacency, neglect, or outright rebellion is disobedience. And so, Lord, I pray that you would give these men the courage to lead according to your Spirit's leadership. For it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Rod. Well, I appreciate Rod here, and uh, if you would just give him a hand of thanks and appreciation today. And uh, um, so, no, whatever you said is in print, Rod, because we didn't bring budget to edit all your orneriness. So uh, we'll just be out there for eternity. And, uh, uh, and so, yeah, yeah. It was somewhere in the Old Testament, in case you didn't know where it was. Anyway, but uh, let me uh, just say a closing word about um, uh, planning. David's over there chuckling because it just goes on and on, doesn't it, brother? <laughs> uh, the banter never stops. Uh, people ask all the time what we will sponsor and what we'll plant around Goba. Uh, we will lead our churches to plant anywhere, any way, by any process, whether it is the, you know, the big, you know, high, you know, uh, big launching large or the small, you know, rabbit start. And I got to tell you, in a, in a challenging economic time, uh, as I told some leaders recently in a meeting that, you know, I was asked, to come. It makes better sense to launch small right now in an eco economical time than a uh, depressed time than it does to launch large. There's greater chance of, of them being up and running on a, uh, on a, a, a financial set of resources that are easily able to be come up with. So people ask all the time, what will we plant uh, in Gobo? Yes. We'll, you know, there's very few things that we, I mean, if it's unbiblical, we're not going to do it, be anything about it. But if it's biblical, um, it doesn't have to have five points and, uh, you know, be able to check seven boxes for, you know, some report. We're going to plan anywhere, every way. And it's what I told you, if, you know, is your vision is for a lifetime plan a church. And somebody asked me one time, what would you be if you weren't a church planner? I said, I'd be ashamed of myself. And uh, uh, so uh, um, that's, yeah, <laughs> still planning, dude. Once a planner, once a planner, always a planner, and because uh, I don't want to be ashamed of myself, and I don't want the Lord to be ashamed of each and every single one of us. So uh, thank you all for being here. Those who have traveled from distance, and I want to say thank you so much for being part of this day. If there's any way we can resource you, uh, Mark or myself, we're here. You got our information in your kit, and uh, we just thank you for journeying with us today. So uh, Rod did close us in prayer, so I'm not going to double pray because then you'd have to judge my prayer life with his, and he couldn't take the pressure. Uh, so anyway, uh, you are dismissed. God bless you. <laughs>